Hello and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and Words on Film is, uh, is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access TV, or some community access TV station that's kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you can join me. I'm glad you can join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And just a disclaimer before we begin, the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of my own, your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station that's airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, let's get into my first segment, What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Last week, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle was number one at the box office for actually the fifth week, and I knew it wasn't going to last. I knew a movie was going to knock it off of the number one spot. Unfortunately, that movie this week is Fifty Shades Freed which tells you a little bit about what I thought of the movie. Fifty Shades Freed is one of the five movies I'll be reviewing for you for this show, so I'm just going to swallow my personal opinion about the movie and just get into the numbers for now. Opinions coming later. This weekend it earned $38.6 million at the U.S. box office against a budget of $55 million, which means it is not a hit yet here in the States. Unfor I shouldn't say unfortunately, but I, I already said it. Unfortunately, it has grossed $136.9 million worldwide, making it a, not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. Peter Rabbit is number two at the box office this weekend, also debuting with Fifty Shades Free, and obviously for a much different crowd. But Peter Rabbit this weekend grossed $25 million in the States against a budget of 50, that's five zero million million, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States, but it's off to a pretty good start. International numbers, despite it being a British film that was filmed in Australia, I don't have those numbers for you. I'll probably have them next week. Number three at the box office, the 1517 to Paris, also debuting this week, earning $12.6 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $30 million, it has also grossed $17.9 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. We'll see how it fares in the coming weeks. Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, was number one at the box office last week and the week before that. This week, it is number four at the box office, having grossed $10 million. Against a budget of 90 to $110 million, somewhere in that range, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle has so far earned a staggering $365.9 million here in the States and $883.4 million worldwide. Now, despite Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle never dropping out of the top five in its eight-week run so far, it is still not grossed as much as Star Wars The Last Jedi, which seemed to be in the top ten one day and then gone the next day. It wasn't literally gone the very next day, but it definitely didn't last in the top ten. But another movie that's lasted in the top ten for quite some time in its eight-week run also has been The Greatest Showman, which was number five at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number four last week, having earned $6.4 million, which isn't much, but it still is good enough to be at number five. Against a budget of $84 million, The Greatest Showman has so far earned $146.6 million here in the States and... $314.5 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, and it may inch its way to being a certified hit, but that will take weeks. And around the world, it is most certainly a certified hit. Maze Runner, The Death Cure, was number two at the box office last week. This week, it's number six at the box office, having earned $6.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of... $62 million, Maze Runner of the Death Cure has so far earned $49.2 million here in the States in its third week in release, and $229.5 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world, surprisingly, it is a certified hit by quite a bit. I couldn't tell you what people outside the U.S. think of Maze Runner, but obviously from the numbers, they think very highly of it. 
Winchester, in its second week of release, fell from number three last week to number seven this week, having earned just $5.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. And it has earned a total so far of $17.3 million at the U.S. box office. I do not have the information for its budget or its international growth, so I could not tell you what kind of hit it is. The Post, in its eighth week in release, or at least its fifth week nationwide release is number eight at the box office sliding from number five last week having earned 3.6 million dollars at the u.s box office this past weekend against a budget of 50 million dollars the post has so far earned 73 million dollars here in the states and 123.2 million dollars worldwide now who's to say what the international appeal of the post is it could be director steven spielberg it could be stars tom hanks and meryl streep or it could be the fact that right now we're kind of experiencing history repeating with the president of the united states being questionable of the mainstream media very much like nixon was in the early 70s that's probably the case, but then again, you'd think, well, why isn't it more popular in the States? But either way, it is a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit worldwide. So very good for the Post, especially going into Oscar season or within Oscar season. The Shape of Water, also speaking of Oscar nominees, is number nine in the box office, just as it was last week, having earned $3.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $19.5 million, The Shape of Water has so far earned $49.9 million here in the States and $74.3 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world in its 11th week in release. And finally, Den of Thieves will probably not be seen in the top 10 this week, or rather next week, but this week it's number 10 at the box office, having earned $3 million even this past weekend. Against a budget of $30 million, though, Den of Thieves has so far earned $41.4 million here in the States and $57 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the states and while a tentative hit around the world it is very close to being a certified hit and probably will be by next week but we may never know when i was little i didn't talk for a long time i was sensitive to lights and sounds so i built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in sometimes i do the same things over and over until one day i found out i had autism my family got me help Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Wait, sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I'm... I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run... Uh, oh, that's right. Radio we, show. Right. We have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the oh, crap. Crap. Yeah. There was a lot of it. Uh huh. And we're trying to bring you f straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. facts. No. The show is called Fact up. up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m. and it's an hour long. Yeah, only on BFR. <coughs> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access TV or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you, or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Facebook Live's, excuse me, on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Fifty Shades Freed, a movie that I was thankful not to have paid for. However, this movie took 105 minutes of my life that I'm never going to get back. So that just basically tells you exactly what I thought of this movie. But I always go into a movie with an open mind thinking to myself yes 50 shades grade 50 shades of gray sucked 
the movie. I haven't read the book. Fifty Shades Darker was a little bit better, I thought, but I gave him my rating last year of a strikeout, which for those of you who don't know my rating system, strikeout is a bad review, but it's not terrible. Flunk out is the awful, is the, is the worst, the lowest of the low. Fifty Shades of Grey got my rating of a flunk out back in 2015. Fifty Shades Darker, I was a little bit nicer to, but after having seen Fifty Shades Freed, I might take that back. But either way, the motto or the, the slogan that of Fifty Shades Freed is, and I quote, don't miss the climax. So, yeah, there, there's sex in this movie, but there's not so much of a climax story-wise. And that may not matter to a lot of people, especially fans of the book and the previous movies. And I really can't speak for how well the book is written. I know it's notorious rather than being a considered even a good piece of literature, but I can't, say, I can't speak for how well it's written because I haven't read it. I will tell you, though, the movies suck. And for a lot of reasons, and the premise doesn't exactly help, but in Fifty Shades Freed, we last left Anastasia and Christian when Christian proposed to Anastasia. So in this one, they get married, and there's no working up to the wedding. They get married right off the bat. But the unfortunate thing is, despite the fact that they're having a pretty good honeymoon period, there's a man by the name of Jack Hyde, who is Anastasia's former boss and her publishing company at which she works, which Christian Grey ultimately bought out, who continues to threaten their relationship. Now, at first, they are having an exotic honeymoon, but then Christian Grey is brought back to the States because um, an unknown assailant broke into Christian Grey's computer room and basically destroyed the computers in there. And that was basically the start of the movie. And one of the biggest weaknesses of Fifty Shades Free, amongst several weaknesses, is there is no focus on the story. And even if there was focus on the story about this guy, Jack Hyde, who at first became notorious in the Fifty Shades franchise for having not only sexually harassed Anastasia Steele, but also sexually assaulted her as well, made the moves on her. But now he's back and not only threatening both of their relationships, but he's also threatening to bring Christian Grey down to his level. And the guy who plays Jack Hyde, who is an actor by the name of Eric Johnson, basically plays this role like Snidely Whiplash. There's basically no subtlety to him. And even though he doesn't have one of those curly mustaches, I felt as if every time he was on screen, and especially every time he was terrorizing Anastasia or Christian, he was basically stroking that imaginary fake twisted mustache because there was no dimension to his character and he was just overall a really stupid character. Speaking of stupid characters, Christian Grey, again here played by Jamie Dornan. You know, it speaks to, I guess, the director, James Foley, wanting to preserve the integrity of the original Fifty Shades of Grey, but let's be honest with ourselves, there was no integrity to that movie. But preserving something by casting Jamie Dornan again, but the truth of the matter is, Jamie Dornan is terrible in this movie. He's absolutely awful. And again, the reason he's bad in this movie is the reason he was bad in the last two films. He does not show any emotion or any charisma even throughout the entire movie. His basic acting is basically opening his eyes during really serious moments, and I should say widening his eyes, and otherwise looking basically the same throughout the entire film. As a matter of fact, there's an argument that Anastasia and Christian get into in this movie that I and a number of other people who were at my screening were laughing at. And this was supposed to be a serious moment where Anastasia re reveals to Christian that she's pregnant. And of course, Christian is not sure about being a father. And honestly... <laughs> I don't think he'd be a good father either, especially if he has that quote-unquote playroom of his. So Fifty Shades Freed is sloppy, and it is probably 
hopefully the end of the 50 shades franchise but then again oh boy i i feel awful to read these statistics 50 shades of gray the original movie from 2015 grossed 571 million dollars worldwide 50 shades darker grossed almost 200 million less than that but that was 381.1 million dollars if this movie makes 200 million dollars or more Chances are they're going to make a fourth film, but my God, I hope they don't. There are so many things wrong with this film, particularly the story, the how clunky it is, the subplots that are addressed, but then by the end don't really get anywhere, the, the fate of certain supporting characters, and of course Christian Grey being a really weak character as portrayed by Jamie Dornan. I would even go as far as to say that while Dakota Johnson, who plays Anastasia Gray, has a bright future in movies and has been great in every movie she's been in, except for ones that start with Fifty Shades, Jamie Dornan should not act in a movie ever again. It goes without saying, Fifty Shades of Freed, excuse me, Fifty Shades Freed is a flunk out. It is a terrible movie, a complete waste of time, and I want my 105 minutes back now. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. <laughs> Probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just pop some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon. Where the sky is even and gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Peter Rabbit, the relatively long-awaited 3D live-action slash CGI animated adventure comedy based on the characters created by the late, great Beatrix Potter. So this movie is not so much an adaptation of particularly the original story of Peter Rabbit written by Beatrix Potter as much as it is sort of a modern adaptation and maybe even more like a sequel to the events that happened in Beatrix Potter's books. And the character of Peter Rabbit in this movie, who's voiced by late night host James Corden, who's a pretty funny guy, is slightly different from how Beatrix Potter wrote him. In the original Peter Rabbit book, and again, this Peter Rabbit is no relation to the Easter Bunny or anything, although it is kind of strange that this movie came out not only before Easter, well before Easter, but even before Ash Wednesday, which is tomorrow, which also happens to be Valentine's Day. But in any event, this Peter, the Peter Rabbit that Beatrix Potter wrote about was a little mischievous, but probably more motivated by his own feeling of instant gratification and self-indulgence. In this movie, Peter Rabbit has that those degrees of desire for instant gratification, although he gratifies himself on vegetables, which kids can learn from. But he's a little bit more like Bugs Bunny than he is like the, the character created by Beatrix Potter. But for those of you who grew up reading the Beatrix Potter books, like I did, you'll be pleased to see a number of other Beatrix Potter characters in this movie, including Peter Rabbit's sisters, Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who in this movie are voiced by Daisy Ridley, Margot Robbie, and Elizabeth Debicki. And the, the, the latter name you're probably not as familiar with, but either way, all three of them make really good voiceover characters. And there's also Peter Rabbit's slovenly cousin Benjamin Bunny, who also makes an appearance here. And there are other characters like Jemima Puddle Duck, Mr. Todd, M Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, who all 
make, well, a little bit more than cameo appearances here. I think for a movie that focuses on Peter Rabbit, this movie does a pretty good job at giving just about all of Beatrix Potter's characters a little bit of the limelight. And I actually would like to see other movies based on the, these characters as well. Maybe they'll come, maybe they won't. But as I said... It, Previously, this movie is a combination of CGI animation and live action. There are some live action characters in this movie, including Peter, Rabber, Peter Rabbit's nemesis, the farmer, Mr. McGregor, who in this movie is played by a very unrecognizable Sam Neill. But not too much of a spoiler alert, I promise you, that Mr. McGregor dies suddenly. It is actually kind of surprising, not that Mr. McGregor dies, that is a bit surprising, but Peter Rabbit's reaction to that, to Mr. McGregor dying, which is quite questionable. But in any event, that Mr. McGregor dies to make room for another Mr. McGregor, in, in this case, McGregor's nephew, Thomas McGregor, played in this movie by Domhnall Gleeson. And Domhnall Gleeson is a Londoner who works at a toy store, a, a prominent toy store in London, who is very good at a job, although he micromanages like crazy, but he eventually finds out that a promotion he's been working hard to get has been passed on to somebody else right when his great uncle, uh, Mr. McGregor, who he never knew, gives his farmland in the country to him. And fortunately for Domhnall Gleeson, he quits his job at the toy store and moves into this new farmhouse. And he has a very lovely neighbor by the name of B, who's played in this movie by Rose Byrne. And havoc ensues when micromanaging Thomas McGregor begins to build up the farm and finds that several of the animals who, who live in the pasture, including Peter Rabbit, try to sneak in. So there are a lot of pretty good slapstick comedy moments in this film. There's a great fight scene. Actually, there are probably two or three great fight scenes between Peter Rabbit and Thomas McGregor. And I've seen Domhnall Gleeson in a number of films over the last couple of years, and I have to say he is a, a really good actor, probably one of the, the best actors working today. I did not know, however, that Domhnall Gleeson could do comedy, particularly physical comedy, but there are various moments in this film that made me laugh, particularly with Domhnall Gleeson in the role. In terms of his relationship with Rose Byrne's character and, of course, him being divided between his hatred for these rabbits, who he, who he mistakenly calls rodents, and also B's unconditional love for them, and also her objections to Thomas McGregor putting up a fence like his great uncle did. The, the story itself was a little bit predictable about how they meet, how they connect, how Peter Rabbit and his friends get in the way, and then there's a falling out, then there's a reconciliation. That's pretty predictable, and the, the way the, the plot resolved itself, I wasn't entirely crazy about, but I did think that the movie was really funny. It had excellent animation. I especially loved the way Peter Rabb was animated. He, other than the jacket he wore and the fact that he talked, he looked like a real rabbit, so I was pretty astonished by how really detailed the CGI in this movie was. I also thought it went for endearing the same way that the two Paddington movies did. I do, however, think that both Paddington movies were better than Peter Rabbit in the sense that I think there's a lot more of a timelessness to the Paddington movies in that the movies won't seem dated 30 or 40 years from now. I can't say the same about Peter Rabbit, especially given the, the soundtrack they worked with, which I think they probably should have done a regular orchestra rather than pop hits, but I did enjoy Peter Rabbit for what it was. I think kids are going to love it. It gets my rating of a high checkout. It would have been a knockout if it hadn't been for the movie trying to be cool in certain areas and Peter Rabbit doing a little bit too much breaking the fourth wall and being a little too clever for its own good, but I did enjoy it and I think you will too. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million.
million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Are you a dope beat looking for a fresh MC? Or maybe you're a fat beat in search of a fly melody. Join DJ Osh every Wednesday from 7 to 8. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one that came out last year, but I just got to see it this uh, or this past weekend. The movie is called Mark Felt, The Man Who Brought Down the White House. And the movie is indeed about Mark Felt, who is the FBI agent who was for over 30 years an anonymous source for reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein and helped them in the investigation, which led them to the Watergate scandal. The movie takes place between 1972 and 1974, around, around the time where J. Edgar Hoover was still alive and leading, or rather being the head of the CIA, and then a couple of weeks later he died, and then it ends a little while after Nixon resigns from the White House. And the movie is shot very coarsely. It's a movie that's that has a very dark feel to it, which I didn't think was particularly necessary for the film. I mean, yes, wa there are a lot of dark secrets in Washington, D.C., but I felt like the movie was trying to look a little bit too much like House of Cards, and I didn't think that atmosphere was entirely necessary, and to be honest, it made me feel a little bit sleepy during the film. But Mark Felt in this movie is played by Liam Neeson, and he's the FBI agent who who became Deep Throat, the longtime anonymous whistleblower who exposed the Watergate scandal. And right after J. Edgar Hoover dies, Mark Felt is called to the Howard Johnson Hotel, which is right across the street, or was right across the street, from the Watergate office. And that was where Alfred was one of the agents who was taking part in the Watergate scandal. He wasn't the one who broke into the Watergate complex, but he was the one across the street who was keeping in, in contact with the Watergate burglars via walkie-talkie. And if you want to see a really good portrayal of the Watergate burglaries dramatized, probably most accurately, definitely see the first five minutes of the movie All the President's Men. It is fantastic. I mean, I when, whenever I watch that film, or not just the film, but also that clip, which is on YouTube, if you want to check it out, I always feel nervous for the Watergate burglars, even though I really shouldn't, even though I know that what they're doing is treasonous and wrong, to say the least. But anyway, just, just a point there about how great the movie All the President's Men is. That's probably one of my top 20 favorite films of all time barely makes the top five but in any event mark felt the man who brought down the white house and that's the entire name of the movie which is a little bit of a mouthful doesn't compare really to all the president's men as a matter of fact there's only one scene where mark felt played by liam neeson meets bob woodward who in this movie is played by julian morris who by the way looks nothing like bob woodward does or did, and they give him long hair to make him look like this laid-back guy, and I don't think Bob Woodward, from the pictures I've seen of him in the early 70s, ever really looked like that. As a matter of fact, I think that Robert Redford got the look of Bob Woodward almost exactly right in All the President's Men. But either way, there's only one scene between Woodward and Felt, and every time, I, or rather, when I saw that scene, I was waiting for the part where Mark Felt said to Bob Woodward, follow the money. And the reason I was waiting for this part was that that's another iconic scene in All the President's Men where Deep Throat, he, he wasn't known as Mark Felt at, at that moment, he was still anonymous, was played by 
Hal Holbrook in a movie in a in a scene where unfortunately Hal Holbrook did not receive an Oscar nomination for that role, but he was also up against a number of other actors like Jason Robards in the same film. But either way, there's only one scene in this movie with Bob Woodward. It doesn't really work. Also, I had I took a lot of issue with Liam Neeson as Mark Felt because the days where Liam Neeson could go into a movie and play a multidimensional character seemed to be just about over. Of course, I'm referring to such films as Schindler's List, but probably most notably, and that was probably Liam Neeson's tour de force. But here, I felt like Liam Neeson was playing the same one-dimensional tough guy he was playing in movies like Taken and probably most recently The Commuter, and there wasn't a lot of dimension to his role. In addition to that, Liam Neeson is in this movie is playing an American and does a very bad job covering his Irish accent. And there's also another character in this movie is played by, his name is uh, Pat Gray, and he's one of Felt's rivals at the FBI, who's played by Martin Sokus, who I don't know what his nationality is, but I could tell, even though he was playing an American by the name of Pat Gray, he, had a, he did a very, very bad job covering his accent, which I assume to be British. So Mark Felt, The Man Who Brought Down the White House, is not a terrible movie, but there are so many things that were missing. Also, the atmosphere was way too dark. It echoed House of Cards too much. In fact, in All the President's Men, Washington, D.C. did not look this drab and dreary. It did during appropriate scenes like when Robert Redford as Bob Woodward meets... Deep Throat, played by Hal Holbrook in the parking garage. But that's where, but of course, that scene takes place at night. It's a very tense atmosphere, so that kind of lighting was appropriate. But when you make the whole movie, or just about the whole movie, at least all the parts that take place in Washington, D.C. that dark, including indoors during the daytime, it, it, the, the novelty of what a dark time this period is completely wears off. So, Mark Felt, the man who brought down the White House, also as Mark Felt's wife, Aubrey Felt, Audrey Felt, and she's a woman who you don't think while watching the film has any history of psychosis, but you realize that she had psychological issues only during the written epilogue at the end. And granted, the written epilogue tells you a lot, which, which is always great. I, I hate it when written epilogues skimp, but unfortunately the movie didn't show enough and told more than it should. For that reason, this movie, which whose name I won't repeat because it's long, gets my rating of a strikeout. They should have hired another actor besides Liam Neeson to play Mark Felt, especially since there had to be more to Mark Felt's personality than Liam Neeson gave. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. 
Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I usually review a lot of films that come out in theaters, but I never rule out movies that are on demand. However, there are several movies on Netflix that I need to see for this show. Mudbound is one of them, also the newest uh, Cloverfield movie, The Cloverfield Paradox. I unfortunately have not seen those, but it's one of those deals where I've been really busy over the last week and I've wanted to see them, but I haven't quite gotten the chance. I also have a number of movies that are sort of on standby that I've seen during the Christmas break, the two-week break where I didn't have this show, and I'm going to review them for you right now. Uh, the first one I'm going to review is a Netflix original, and it's called Bright. And this is a movie starring Will Smith and a barely recognizable Joel Edgerton. It's set in a world where fantasy creatures live side by side with humans, and a human cop, Will Smith, is forced to work with an orc to find a weapon everyone is prepared to kill for. That's the synopsis of Bright in a nutshell. And it premiered on Netflix on December 22nd of last year, and it became one of the sites most streamed programs ever. Very similar to the way Adam Sandler's original movie, The Ridiculous Six, which could have been released in theaters, but instead was released on Netflix, was at the time that it premiered the most streamed movie ever. But very much like The Ridiculous Six, Bright received negative reviews, and not only from critics, but also from audiences. And I saw it, and I thought that the premise was very original. In fact, it's written by Max Landis, who is not only John Landis' son, but he also has been working on other films such as... <laughs> uh, let me... Th uh, he, he wrote the films Victor Frankenstein, uh, which was not a particularly well-received movie. He's also writing a remake of An American Werewolf in London, which I'm absolutely against because he definitely shouldn't do that. But he also actually wrote the screenplay for Chronicle with Josh Trank. And Chronicle was a really good movie. Unfortunately, I think Max Landis is following the same track as Josh Trank is in After Chronicle, he hasn't quite lived up to his potential. Bright is also directed by David Ayer, who directed the controversial DC Cinematic Universe movie. I temporarily forgot. It was the movie also starring Will Smith, Suicide Squad. <laughs> Remember that I, I don't work with a lot of notes, so sometimes the names of movies or even actors kind of float by, but David Ayer directed the controversial Suicide Squad. It's not so much controversial for its premise or its content. It's controversial because some people really liked it and others really hated it. I was one of the ones who leaned more towards liking it, but either way, it's I wouldn't say it's a controversial movie. It's war with humans. And it would have been great if this movie had actually shown the war between orcs and humans and what was at stake, but the movie gives very fleeting exposition. What's also noteworthy about this film is Bright seems to be a movie that's allegorious in the same way that Alien Nation was. A Alien Nation is an underrated movie starring James Caan and Mandy Patinkin, where aliens in that film, very similar to District 9, are allegorious to immigrants. They are controversial, they're certainly looked down upon by humans, but some of them actually contribute to society and also the prevention of wrongdoing. The same premise is here in Bright. Unfortunately, orcs are meant to be in this movie allegorious to African Americans in the sense that maybe some orcs are police officers, but they're, they are still also targeted by the, the police, particularly the LAPD, in this film. And in a lot of ways, that allegory to African Americans falls very flat in this film. And it doesn't help that the exposition about what the world was like before 
this present day alternative universe, it, it doesn't really help very much. But I do have to say that Joel Edgerton not only is unrecognizable in this film, he also does a pretty decent acting job as Will, S Will Smith's reluctant partner, Nick Jacoby. But where the movie falls apart is where it follows so many buddy cop movie cliches. Although this movie is a little bit more dramatic than I think it probably needed to be, especially since we have Will Smith in this film. And this film could have been funny, or Will Smith could have brought a lot more charisma to this movie. And it's not that he doesn't bring any charisma. And there are movies of his like Seven Pounds where he not only doesn't bring any charisma, he also mopes throughout the film. This is not one of those movies. I, I think he and Joel Edgerton's character of Jake, uh, Officer Jacoby work relatively well alongside one another. They don't have a lot of chemistry, but they're not supposed to have chemistry. But the movie fails in the sense that it's just a not only a cliche buddy cop drama, but this world, which could have been so expansive, is just you're, you're given a couple of fleeting moments of telling exposition. So Bright is a disappointment. I didn't hate the movie, but it gets my rating of a strikeout because it's a movie with so much promise and so much potential, but way too many plot holes, way too many allegories that fall flat. And on the whole, just overall, other than the special effects and its makeup, it's a very unforgettable endeavor. And if this movie had opened up in theaters, I think it would have bombed a lot more than it did on Netflix. Man, do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go, big guy. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. I love those real sick signs. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blown, neurotic tone. Intensify and groove me. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to review is very much like Bright. It is also a Netflix original, this time a, an original documentary that debuted on Netflix on December 1st of last year. But of course, it being a Netflix original, you can still see it on Netflix right now. I, I don't know if Netflix ever pulls any of their original movies. They, they certainly pull TV shows and movies that they get from other sources, but their originals, as far as I know, they stay on Netflix streaming for as, as long as Netflix wants, maybe even forever. But Voyeur is about journalist, journalism icon Gay Talese, who's an 82-year-old report, uh, reporter, a veteran reporter, who's been reporting since the 50s. And in Voyeur, he reports on a, a gentleman by the name of Gerald Foos, who's the owner of a Colorado motel, who allegedly secretly watched his guests with the aid of a specially designed ceiling vent, peering down from an, and I quote, observation platform he built in the motel's attic. So... Gerald Foos is more or less a peeping Tom, but he doesn't videotape his voyeurism. He just basically goes into hotel rooms and learns a lot about human activity as people are going about their daily business, or nightly business even, if you know what I mean, in his hotel rooms. So the motel th that Gerald Foos used to own is he, do, he not only doesn't own anymore, but it's also been demolished. However, Gay Talese took his interviews with Gerald Foos and put them into a best-selling nonfiction book by the name of The Boyer's Motel. And The Boyer's Motel was a bestseller. As a matter of fact, 
it's such a compelling read that Steven Spielberg actually bought the rights to the movie, and the movie is in pre-production right now and is set to be directed by director Sam Mendes, who brought us American Beauty, amongst other movies. And it certainly is a very fascinating topic, albeit a creepy one, because if I even had the inclination that I stayed in a hotel or a motel and somebody was watching me, regardless of what their motives were, I would be freaked out as all heck. And it goes without saying that this invasion of privacy is illegal, or at least it was at the time, but now Gerald Foos is able to come clean to journalism icon Gay Talese because of the fact that the statute of limitations is way past. So no one can sue Gerald Foos for snooping on them. Either way, it's still kind of creepy and may made me want to think twice about staying in a hotel. But the story of Gerald Foos, as told by Gay Talese in this fascinating documentary, is indeed appealing and certainly it's creepy absolutely but it is very intriguing because eh, people who snoop like this you want to know their story you want to know what why they do what they do or what their fascination with human nature is and gerald foos's story is a lot more fascination than it is perversion or the peeping tom type motivation but the, the movie also takes a separate tangent when Gaitley's publishes the book The Voyeur's Motel about Gerald Foos and Mr. Foos himself finds that he can't really handle his newfound fame he of course wants to be famous to a certain extent, but also finds that once he gets what he wants, even though he's not as desperate or or gregarious for fame the the way other people who seek fame might be like the Kardashians, he still finds the subject of, or the idea of being famous intriguing, as many of us, almost all of us, would. But he finds that that certainly comes at a price, and... Of course, there is... Gaitalese has always been a controversial journalist. As a matter of fact, he was reporting in the 70s about couples who swap, and he took part in that despite the fact that he was married. But he wanted to be fully immersed in his, his journalistic endeavors. So... There's, there's that aspect of Gaitalese being a fearless journalist, which is admirable in a certain respect, but, of course, that sort of fearlessness does not come without its controversies. And the subject of a person who owns a motel just so he could spy on people is indeed intriguing, but if you, if you even had that secret interest, and whether or not you did, I'm not exactly judging you but would you want even one person to know about it and if you did how would you be able to handle that kind of attention because obviously an idea of a motel owner spying on his guests is not something a lot of people are going to be taking lightly even though he did this years ago and the statute of limitations is expired But Voyeur Voyeur is a documentary that raises a lot of interesting questions, and fortunately with Netflix and the number of subscribers to Netflix, a lot of people can see this movie and judge for themselves. It's not a movie you have to exactly go out of your way to see. So when it comes to documentaries, it is very difficult for me to, to tell what's a good documentary from a great documentary or whether... It should have my four-tiered rating system like it do, like it does. But my basic criteria, it may be basic with with documentaries, is does it tell a compelling story or doesn't it? Are the facts organized or are they not? 
And I'd say that's a resounding yes with this documentary, Boyer. It's not a movie I would expect to be nominated for any Oscars, and it hasn't been. But I was still intrigued by it, and I liked it a lot. And I liked the various levels of questions that it brought to the viewer. And it gets my rating of a knockout. It's certainly a very intriguing documentary about intriguing people, both the journalist and the, the subject. And it's not a movie you see a lot on a regular basis, nor should you. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion... Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio, that's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed the five movies I needed to review for the show, I'm now going to get into my final segment, which is what's coming out next. The other, the spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend, probably at a theater near you, unless I say otherwise. Well, the big movie that people have been anticipating for a really long time, for at least the, the last couple of months, that's coming out this coming Friday, is Black Panther, which I believe is the 18th movie in the Marvel Comics universe, but it shows that the Marvel Comics universe is not slowing down at all. Now, we were introduced to the character of Black Panther, played by Chadwick Boseman, in Captain America's Civil War, which was one of the better Marvel Cinematic Universe movies to come out so far, and I, I, I eventually have to make a list of what's the, the best and the worst quote-unquote worst Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. i probably say the quote-unquote worst is The Incredible Hulk, but that's only because eh, Edward Norton kind of screwed up there and really shot his career in the foot by making his various demands. But anyway, on to Black Panther. Black Panther tells the story of T'Challa, who, after the death of his father, the king of Wakanda and Wakanda is a fictional African nation, returns home to the isolated, technologically advanced African nation. You don't hear that a lot, technologically advanced African nation, but in the Marvel Comics universe, why not? To succeed to the throne and take his rightful place as king. Now, from that description, you wouldn't guess this was a superhero movie, but it most certainly is. It's not just about somebody taking his rightful place as king. It's probably also about somebody who is finding his strengths and weaknesses as a superhero. So Chadwick Boseman is back to play T'Challa, also known as Black Panther. And the movie also stars Michael B. Jordan, Academy Award winner Lupita Nyong'o, Danai Guerrero, Academy Award nominee Angela Bassett, Academy Award winner Forrest Whitaker, and several other notable actors. Amongst the few white actors in the movie are Martin Freeman, best known for playing... Bilbo Baggins in the Hobbit movies. And also, there is there are a couple of other um, actors of note. But Black Panther is a movie I will definitely be reviewing for next week's show. This is a movie just about everyone I've spoken to or everyone who wants to talk movies about me or with, with me, who will talk about movies with me, has brought up Black Panther. Whether they're black or white, people are really excited about this film. And... This is not the first superhero movie with a predominantly African American cast, but it's it's still going to be it's it's still probably slated to be the best. Now, I am going to go into this movie with an open mind, but I'm very excited about seeing it and I will tell you what I think of the movie when I review the movie for you next week. 
Another movie that's coming out that's probably not going to do as well as Black Panther is a stop-motion animation film called Early Man. And this is from the creators of Wallace and Gromit, the people at Aardvark Studios. And it's set at the dawn of time when prehistoric creatures and woolly mammoths roam the earth. And Early Man tells the story of Doug, spelled D-U-G, not D-O-U-G, along with his sidekick Hobnob, as they unite his tribe against a mighty enemy, Lord Nuth, and his Bronze Age city to save their home. The people who star as the voice actors in this movie include Tom Hiddleston, Eddie Redmayne, Maisie Williams, and Timothy Spall. This is a movie that definitely looks like it's particularly well animated, and this is also a movie that I will be reviewing for you next week. I'm really excited to see this one as well. It's, again, not going to do as well as Black Panther, but I'm going to see it anyway. I'm going to let you know what I think. Another movie that's coming that might be coming to a theater near you is one that's called Samson, and this is from Pure Flix Studios. It's about Samson and Delilah, and after losing the love of his life to a cruel Philistine prince, a young Hebrew with supernatural strength defends his people, sacrificing everything to avenge his love, his people, and his God. So, no movie I've seen from Pure Flix or any of these religious films have been great, but this tells a biblical story, so it might have some potential. But Samson in this movie is played by Jackson Rathbone, and the movie also co-stars Billy Zane, Taylor James, and Rutger Hauer. I'm not sure if I'm going to see this film, but I'm going to give it my best. But in any event, that just about does it for this week's edition of Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. Just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of my own, your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees that are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. But I'm really excited for next week, with, with that being said, and I'm especially excited to see Black Panther. I can't wait to see how it turns out. Again, I should keep an open mind, but I am... <laughs> I, I'm excited for some movies o over others, and it looks like it's going to be a good week for movies. So regardless of whether you go out in the theaters or whether you stay at home, watch a good video-on-demand movie, this is Dan Burke saying, as always, I'll see you at the movies.